since a national crisis broke out, international crisis, and we are joined uh, by someone who's doing something here in Pima County about that, uh, Count Constable Joe Ferguson. Joe, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Uh, you uh, have had kind of a whirlwind year. Uh, you became a constable here in Pima County pretty recently, and now you are having to deal with something that someone in your type of position probably hasn't had to deal with in decades, if ever. We really don't have any experience with this or any history of it. I am two months on the job, and I am still waiting for official gear. So, yeah, I, I am definitely um, was thrown into the deep end of the pool recently when it came to um, the coronavirus and how to help people shelter in place. So, but you, I think, you know, it, at least publicly from my perspective of all the constables in Arizona, it seemed like you were kind of taking the lead on helping uh, to, to push this, this idea that, that eviction should be halted for the time being. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I have a great partner, um, Kristen Randall. She was with me every step of the way on this. But, you know, as we realized that government was shutting down, that schools were shutting down, that the last thing you really wanted to do is to go into places where there might be people sheltering in place that could have been exposed to these or even have it and to say, no, I'm sorry, we've got a judge's order, you have to go. That just puts a strain on our, our first responders, our hospitals, our nurses, and our shelters by doing evictions right now. And, you know, we saw other states, California, Texas, deciding that they were going to do the exact same thing and just put a moratorium on evictions. And so we wanted to do the same thing. Um, we waited, waited a little bit more. And then when we did have action, we took action. And so we announced all 10 of us here in Pima County decided that we weren't going to do evictions. So, we stopped doing them last week. And is that is that just for public housing, or is that any rental property in, so, in your, your area? So the city of Tucson did a really good job. Um, last week, they announced that they were going to stop doing evictions on all of their public housing. So that, that took a decision out of our hands, and that was one less group of people that we were dealing with for evictions. And that is, that's going swimmingly. We're not evicting anybody who's on Section 8 or in city housing. But the stuff that we're talking about is mostly a private transaction between two people. My job as the constable is to do the evictions after a judge um, orders that they happen. So I'm kind of the last person they see when an eviction happens. And so we just decided to do it for all private evictions where there wasn't any kind of extenuating circumstances. An example might be to do emergency evictions where sometimes there's a real need to get somebody out of an apartment very quickly for, you know, they're a danger to themselves or others. And those come in once in a while. And so those still could be technically done, but the, the court just closed and is going to wrap up all of their evictions in the next couple of days. Have you spoken with any of your colleagues from other parts of the state, the constables in Maricopa County or, or Cochise? We have heard you... unofficially from some other constables that they are very happy with what we are doing, but I haven't had anything official come in yet. Nobody has sent any flowers that I'm aware of. So, I, I and this is always something, because, I mean, you are... In many ways, I mean, you are an elected law enforcement position. Um, yep. Now, and it's it's they're partisan races. Is there a difference in how political ideology impacts how constables or, or any peace officer reacts in this type of scenario? I, I think so. And so, I am hopefully a new generation of constables that are getting involved in this job. Typically, a lot of people have handled this in a law enforcement way to do it. They retired from a police department or a sheriff's office, and they've decided just to do a constabling, you know, for their last 10 years of public service. And they've just kind of handled it as an extension of the court. They get the court paperwork and they deliver it. And all of them, I'm sure, do it in a very different way, but many of them do it in a humane fashion. You know, I know that 
some of my predecessors really took time to help people and maybe offer them some services or maybe if they needed an extra day in their apartment to get out, they do that. But I'm a little bit different. I'm coming in where I'm saying I want to do and as many as few evictions as possible and, you know, help as many people as possible. And what I mean by that really has to go back to how evictions work in Arizona. They go lightning quick compared to just about any other state. We kind of lead the nation in how fast evictions can happen here. For what it's worth, you could go from missing your rent payment and 16 days later, a constable shows up to your door to evict you. And so what I've done and what two other constables are doing right now is that we are going to take the court papers from eviction court. So about 90% of people who have an eviction never go to court. They can't for a million different reasons, child care, they're working, they don't think the judge is going to listen to them, they just don't go. And when they don't go, they often lose their case, and then they often don't know how long they have in their home. And so I'm taking those papers and I'm hand delivering them to those people the day after the court case. And then I can counsel them. I can bring with them pieces of paper. I can talk to them about the eviction process. I can talk to them about um, what used to be in these eviction of um, prevention grants. I can also give them information about shelters and about apartment complexes that may take somebody who has had an eviction on the record. You know, trying to find ways to minimize what happens after the eviction. And I got to tell you that if you show up at somebody's house four days before the eviction and you say, listen, I'm here to help, this helps a lot of people. And we're seeing that people go to their landlords and start talking again and they make post agreement judgments that allow them to stay in place. We find that there are other ways that they can help. They talk to all public services and find you know, that they they qualify for a grant or they qualify for some Section 8 housing, things like this that really offer a long-term way for them to either stay in their house or find new housing rather than just being on the streets homeless. We see too many people right now that just fall through the cracks. Do you have a lot of interaction with landlords as well or... Yeah, I mean, I, 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 so, I mean, one of the first things we do is that, you know, I'll get a piece of paper from the court saying this is the eviction. And so we talk to the landlords. We say, okay, you know, what's going on? What can you tell me? You know, that kind of thing. And sometimes, you know, they give us, a, you know, a story about what's going on with these people. Some have been really great. They've been the best resource you could possibly ask for where they say, this is the issue. You know, I'm willing to take some time. And others... Not so much, but I talk to all my landlords for every eviction I do. And, you know, we're still estimating that, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of doing somewhere between 50 and 70 a month in my my little area. Wow. There has been, I think, nationwide, uh, you see it online, uh, you kind of see it all over right now, in response to to this crisis. And the way that some landlords and property management groups have behaved in the last two weeks, there's been a very uh, vocal backlash against uh, landlords. I think as a, you wouldn't call it a profession, I guess, but I guess, as, I don't know, as a class or a, as a as a type of property holder. Um, do you think that's justified? Do you think that, do you think there should, that I this is that exposed? Hear, I think we hear a lot about small businesses being able to get loans. I hear, I think we hear a lot about big businesses who've often gotten tax breaks that have often been the beneficiary of bailouts, buyouts, helps in the government during economic crises. And we wonder about the little guy. We wonder about renters. We wonder about people that have been one paycheck away from being homeless. I've been there. I've been, you know, very close to being on the other side of an eviction order myself over the years. And, you know, I had to borrow from friends or, you know, miss the gas payment so I could make the electric bill payment. Those kind of things have happened to me. I know what that's like. And so I think that there's a lot of people who feel this kind of outrage towards it. Um, we are trying to convince the governor right now. Uh, a lot of state Senate Democrats and a lot of House Democrats are putting together a multi-million dollar program where it's designed to help renters. And by that, that we mean, you know, an eviction for prevention grant where it helps 
John stay in his apartment, but the payment goes to the landlord so that the landlord is made whole and the, the person gets to stay there until these things can, can, can figure it out. You know, it might be might be a small drop in the bucket compared to the trillion dollar um, policy I'm hearing about coming out of Washington right now. But, you know, ten million dollars could help a lot of people stay in their homes in the next month. I, mean, I think absolutely. I think it absolutely is a is a complete game changer in you know I gotta, the type of assistance that's needed because it, it you know I mean there, I can't think of anything that sounds more dangerous during a you know contagious an outbreak of a contagious disease than people being out on the street without a home, without shelter, or if huh. a shelter becomes compromised and it has to close down. I mean, we are in a very precarious time and so the best thing we can do is to help people stay in their homes right now and so i've been using my voice to try to convince as many people that this is a good idea the odd thing is is that the state had three months ago a for a eviction prevention grant and it worked just the way it was supposed to somebody couldn't make you know could make the bills because they had a car payment they lost their job but otherwise they had been a great tenant and that grant was helping people stay in their place. It was a pilot program. It just happened to end right before this, this outbreak happened. But I mean, we have all the mechanisms in place to refund that and to expand that to help people right here in Arizona. And Pima County is ready to, you know, keep using that program. It has partners that were, you know, administering it just two months ago. And so it's just convincing the governor and Republicans in the House and the Senate to back this idea. I think that it is probably the single dollar for dollar best way to help our brothers and sisters who live next door to us. You know, I think that that touches on kind of an interesting thing, which is a there, there's an idea of just a, a general, uh, I mean, you know, better policy to prepare for kind of the, the worst case. And, I mean, when it comes to housing. I think we're all in agreement that eventually we as a nation, we as a global community, we're going to get through this. We just don't know how long it'll take. But how do we prepare for the next one? Not just the next pandemic, uh, pandemic, but the next emergency scenario. What type of policy from the local to state to federal level should we have in place for housing so people are safe? Well, so, I mean, there's a lot of different things in place. So. I think for me, you know, my world as a constable right now is about renters. I, I deal with people who are in renter contracts all day long. And so I'm a little bit, um, you know, out of touch with what's going on in terms of foreclosures and mortgages. But for renters, you know, I think that we could make changes to the state's um, essentially bill of rights when it comes to renter protections. There should be more of them in place. An eviction shouldn't probably take just 16 days. We have very little in the way of rules and protections in place for if you get evicted, but you put into place some kind of agreement after the judgment in terms of that judgment, of that agreement being honored. So there are a lot of different things that we could do afterwards that really could help. But I got to tell you that I drive a lot in, in South Tucson and I think that there is a real opportunity for us to look at smaller, affordable homes that are maybe in the government's control. Pima County, South Tucson, City of Tucson, that would be just affordable. You know, there's a lot of empty lots where you could put a small house that people could afford. Because right now the rents are increasing and increasing and the places in Midtown that used to be affordable are being bought up and are becoming less affordable. And so I think there's this real need for blue collar housing in this town that we're dangerously lacking right now. And so I see, I drive by these small pumping stations that the city of Tucson has. City owned property, it's got these small pumping stations that are in place, you know, just to make sure that the water keeps flowing, which we all want, but they sit on a half an acre. Could you put a tiny house on that property? Probably. It's just looking at how to rethink how we look at housing, especially here in Arizona, where land is cheap by comparison to the rest of the country. 
It definitely is. I mean, I, it definitely is. And I think there's also, I mean, there's something about the concept of, of building up instead of just out uh, sure. and how that can impact pricing as well. Um, and I mean, you know, it, it's an interesting point because I think we were, we were in the middle of this kind of nationwide rent crisis that was just starting to trickle down into Arizona in the last couple of years. But uh, we started seeing it. I think we started seeing it quickly in downtown and midtown. I mean, the, the prices were skyrocketing. Um, it, I think it left people incredibly vulnerable for something like this. And it is, a, it is an all hands on deck moment. My, one of my real questions here is what, what what does it actually very practically look like for these tenants who let's say they you you know you are able to, to delay their eviction through the end of the health crisis are they still getting evicted afterwards or is there steps that they can take to mediate their situation in the middle I, I think there is but I am just one cog in this giant machine and so you know if you get a stay on your eviction you know there are still decisions we made about you know are there daily fees accruing is is there money coming in in terms of relief from the government right now i know there's a federal stimulus where some people might qualify to get some money in from the government i know that you know there's a push to make the uh unemployment benefits a little bit more realistic to what's going on for an average person just trying to eke out a life here and so you know without those questions answered i really don't know what to do other than to say and to beg your listeners to talk to your landlords because no matter what i can do in my very very limited capacity i have seen some incredible generosity from some landlords i know that right now there is a facebook message about a woman who got a note from her landlord who said he uh, forgave the rent for another individual and that the only way to be fair was to forgive the rent for everybody that was living there that month. And so as many horror stories as we're hearing about people being kicked out over very small mo- amounts of rent, there are also, you know, some landlords that are really trying to help the people that are living in their complexes, their houses, their trailers. Well, I, I mean, that, that is always the thing about, I think, a crisis, right? Is it, show, it shows us the best and the worst of people. And there is a tendency, I think, when we start seeing the worst of certain groups of people to, to want to lump them together. Um, yes. You know, we, when we see these property, ma- and a lot of times it seems like it's property management companies, from what I've been seeing, who are, you know, attempting to to, to expedite evictions of people um, in anticipation of rent not being processed and things like this. Um, you know, those are becoming national headlines, and they are ugly, and they, uh, the problem is sometimes it's very difficult to... I think we as humans, we tend not to direct our scorn at a single person. Right. We tend to start broadly leeching that out towards everybody. Sure. And uh, most people don't like their landlords. I've had a lot of landlords over the years. Most of them have been awful. You know, let's, I mean, let's, let's be candid. Sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, there is this, there is this feeling that by and large, most landlords don't really do anything. You know, they just, they just kind of hoard property and, and, you know, up, upsell it, up, upcharge on it. Um, but on the flip side, I mean, we are seeing these people who are, are really stepping up and trying to help and trying to contribute and pull their weight. And that's no different, I think, than what we're seeing in the rest of the population. Um, what are other resources that people can take advantage of? I know you said talk to your landlord, but are there any, is there anything else? I mean, uh, at private, public, just any resources at all that you're aware of that people should try to go to? So I think that, you know, there's some nonprofits in town. I really do like Old Pueblo Community Services um, in terms of their ability to help people. They're aware of grants and other programs that I'm just simply can't keep on top of. I, they have staff that's dedicated to that. And I think that if somebody's in real jeopardy of being evicted, that those would be, that'd be probably the best agency to reach out with. Although there are some other great ones out there that I'm certainly going to forget to mention. Um, and uh, maybe you could, uh, maybe you can send me a list later and we'll, we'll blast can, that out to I people. Can send that would... without resources. Absolutely. We've got a whole booklet. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, we'll, I'll make sure to, to distribute okay. that. When we do, we do evictions, you know, we do try to give those people those evictions and, you know, places they can go to and things like that. 
it would be great if that got into more hands and I would appreciate your help with that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I'm here for <laughs> to, to, to distribute information. Um, you, uh, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, what you and your office are doing, uh, in response to the crisis created by this coronavirus. What, uh, let's talk a little bit about what your office would be doing in normal times though. Um, you know, constables are like the position. I feel like a lot of people go, go and vote for it and they have no idea what they're voting on. So Ex I, explain it. I deliver bad news for a living. That is the shortest and most concise way to explain what I do every day. And so when a justice of the peace makes a decision and that order needs to be carried out, a lot of them have to be hand delivered to a house or an apartment. And I'm that person. And so while we've talked a lot about evictions, you know, there are other things that constables do. And so um, it's much, much more than just being a processor. And so I got to tell you that I represent both South Tucson, the Midvale Park area, but I also represent most of the area surrounding the University of Arizona. And a lot of my work, every week, I'm doing orders of protection people that are genuinely afraid of somebody else and they've asked a judge to step in and to limit contact between these two people. Um, this is a bulk of my work and in the very few months that I've been on the job, I have been shaken to my core at how badly we can mistreat each other and how much some people can just be terrorized by another individual. And so I deliver those orders of protection and hopefully with me there in uniform, badge and all my accoutrements that they take what I'm telling them seriously. It's a civil matter, but the minute they text again or pick up the phone or stop by their work, it, you know, it, it turns into a criminal matter and the sheriff's office or TPD will arrest those people. And so I got to tell you that there is a little bit of a game involved when it comes to serving these orders of protection. Some people know that they're coming and they just avoid service. They'll lie to me. They'll, they will, you know, say right to my face, well, I'm not that person. And so, you know, some parts of my day is literally chasing people around just to give them those orders of protection, just to get the process started so that victims in Pima County can have some start and hope for, you know, relief in this matter. And so I think that's a really big part of what I do as a, a constable right now. I have seen and some, I think I was just gonna say, I've seen some people, you know, right after the incident, broken, bloodied and scared. And so you know, I think that it's easy to assume that an order of protection, an order of harassment is just a no contact order. But, you know, not serving and having it serving it is the matter of, you know, people being able to sleep at night. And sometimes, honestly, life or death. Yeah. And so and, and that yeah. includes sometimes, you know, we have to evict people from their houses through an order of protection. So, you know roommates fight with each other and what the judge finds that that person has to leave. And so, you know, that also happens sometimes. So now just, just to go into to your background, cause I think you, you came into this position and, and you touched on this earlier in kind of a, a fairly roundabout, almost different, different than the normal yeah. kind of way. Uh, you, you, you do not have a background in law enforcement, correct? No. Or criminal justice. No, no, I, I've um, neither been a law enforcement agent and nor have I spent any time in jail. <laughs> those are probably both, uh, I would, I would, honestly, those are probably both good things to be in this kind of position because it does allow you, I think, to bring a different perspective. Um, yeah. Do you, do you think, I mean, do you see that as a strength for yourself and, and, you know, as a peace officer? I am not, I'm not necessarily trying to, uh, diminish the role of the people that came before me. But I think that it's a new set of eyes. And I think that, you know, a policy wonk in Bennett Bernal, a former hydrologist in Kristen Randall, and a former journalist in myself are bringing a very new look at how 
we can be constables in an era of trying to be community minded. And so I think that that's going to be very helpful. And I think that it's a good thing. I don't know if we need 10 of us, although I would love to see what happens if we all got together. But I think that we can reform just inside our own office how we treat other people in what really probably is one of their worst moments of their life. And act with compassion and humanity. Because I have certainly made a lot of mistakes. And I have certainly been close to being evicted in my life. You know, there are larger conversations going on in the country about criminal justice reform that I think are taking, uh, you know, kind of, kind of a, a magnifying glass onto these local elected positions that have to do with both the civil and criminal side of, you know, uh, of the legal system. Um, how do you anticipate that changing uh, kind of the, the level of visibility that, you know, you have as a constable and, and your, how you operate, how you work as both a politician and an elected official? I, I would, so I've already suggested that at some point when we have the ability to after this crisis is over, I think that, you know, it wouldn't be unreasonable for me to wear um, a, a camera, a body camera, so that all of my movements, all of my interactions are there for somebody to review, that is there to make it public. I try to treat everything I do as public as it is, but, you know, that camera would give an extra level of transparency. I invite the public to come out with me and you know, go on a ride along or just talk to me about what they think I'm doing right or wrong. I, uh, I think there's a lot of reform that still can happen. And I'm an optimist. I really am. And I believe in the idea that the arc of our future is progress. And so maybe our office hasn't figured everything out today. But in two years and four years, I think the community would be proud of where we've taken this department before the outbreak of this coronavirus, what were some of the goals that you were hoping to be working on uh, so, this year in office? So the, the I talked a little bit earlier about serving these papers to the people who don't go to court. Um, that was, we called that our pilot program and we're going to continue to do that. Um, for what it's worth, I do those in my official capacity as a politician. And so I do them on nights and weekends. I, uh, I went to a 12 doors today and talked to people about eviction and other matters today on a Sunday. Um, I'm trying to make sure that I do more of that kind of work. I don't want to be a nine to five kind of constable. Um, before the outbreak, we, uh, we convinced the city council to give us as an office 30 vouchers for Section 8 housing. Um, the city has a backlog of extra vouchers, but when we hit, hit a wall on some of these cases where we are trying to find a place for somebody to go and there are no options left, you know, having a fast track of just a handful of vouchers to take somebody who can't go anywhere else and uh, be put into this Section 8 housing is a really great thing. The city council has backed us on it. Um, about a month ago, they helped us take this paraplegic guy who was completely independent other than have, needing a caregiver for you know one hour a day or so. He was completely independent. He was living off of social security and he got evicted because they raised the rents. He didn't do anything wrong, but because he was a paraplegic, because of his age, and because of his living income, he had nowhere to go. He was absolutely going to be homeless. And it was only when Richard Fimbres stepped in and helped him get a Section 8 voucher that we saved that guy from being homeless in what was a very cold time at, in Tucson. I mean, those nights were brutally cold, and he was hours away from being you know, put on the street with nowhere to go. And so... You know, that was a, a big thing. The city council has been great about that. Um, if we had had that program six months ago, I can think of a family that wouldn't have had to have their very young kids sleep in an actual wash at night. 
And so that was some of the things that we were working on. I think we've accomplished them and I mean, we've got great support from the city council, but um, that's what we were working on before this all happened. Let's take it back uh, to, to you as, as a public figure. You sought appointment yes. to be a constable. Why, why did you want to make this career change? Why did you want to become a constable? I was recruited. I mean, I, uh, I was following what Kristen and Bernal were, Bennett were doing because I was teaching a class at the University of Arizona on public reporting. And I turned my students to focus on evictions for a semester. There is virtually nobody, no advocates, nobody inside eviction court. And I thought it was a great idea to send 20 students to eviction court to tell those stories, to find out why people were evicted, where they were being evicted from, and for how much. And so by becoming this teacher of that class and making them learn about evictions, I had to learn about evictions. And when this opening came up abruptly, I was approached by people to take to apply. Um, for a lot of reasons, but one of them was because the other candidate who wanted the job wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. They were more of a law and order kind of type person that didn't want to see reform inside the office. And, uh, so you're up for re-election. This I is am. the first. This is the first time that you've ever ran for office. In reality, um, yes. You no. Know, are you? How are you feeling about it? How, what is this transition like? Uh, it's been an it's been an intense transition. Um, I uh, really have been blessed by learning how many friends I've had in the community when I. Uh, told the world that I'm a Democrat, that I have some progressive ideas on how to reform the constable's office, and that I need not only their signature to get on the ballot, but their support in making sure that I win in November. And so it's been very heartening to do that. Um, I wasn't quite sure how people were going to react to Joe the journalist becoming Joe the politician. And does Joe the politician, Do you have you thought about higher office? I mean, are you thinking about this being a longer career outside of just the constable's office? or You know, I, I as, as long as my uh, body holds out, I, I think I really want to stay where I'm at. I, uh, I like people. I got into journalism because I like people and I wanted to help people. And at this gravel, at this ground game, I can do that really well. I have no interest right now in doing anything else. I uh, I want to do this in 2024, 2028, and as long as the body holds out, maybe 2032. Well, Joe, uh, thank you so much for coming on today. Do you? What are your final thoughts? What what is what was the last thing you would like to to impart um, on on the audience about this? I think that this is a, a really important issue. I'm grateful that we got to talk about it. And I'm hoping that the conversation can continue. I'm one guy with a bachelor's degree in journalism. I am certain that we can do even more with, you know, if we help each other out. And so I'm open to ideas. It's pretty easy to find me online. And I'd love to hear from people on their thoughts on how we can make Tucson better. How should people find you online? What's the Got best it. way to get in touch with you? I think Twitter is probably the easiest thing to recite out loud. I am Joe Ferguson on Twitter. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Constable Joe Ferguson. Uh, thank, thank you for joining us. Sure. Thank you. Bye.